today we're going to be taking a look at this very low-end door access system from Amazon. We'll be taking a look at each of the components, we'll be setting it up, I'll demonstrate how all the components go to work together, how each part works in itself, and then I'll be demonstrating a pretty major security flaw with these devices and why you shouldn't really trust them. So this is the Dongyang RFID keypad door access control system kit, 180kg magnetic lock plus power supply plus 10 pieces key fob full set. And it's available from Amazon for £31.85, which is very low price for some sort of door access control system. And they try and advertise this as like a door access control system for, you know, offices and commercial places. And while on the surface it looks like the sort of system you would see in a big office, it is not and has got quite a glaring security flaw. Now, why have I bought this? I've bought this for a couple of the components from it. I need a magnetic lock and I need the power supply control module. And ultimately, buying them separately versus in this kit, the price difference wasn't significant, so I thought I'll buy the full kit, make this video on it, and then in a future video, I'll do a video showing the project that I'm doing, which uses these components, but in a very different way. But yeah, what we'll do is we'll dig into this kit, take a look at all the components, set it all up, and then I'll show the security flaw with these. And I will say they're not like the worst, like it, it is usable for like a small, like a, you know, a cupboard sort of thing. It's fine for securing like a small cupboard or stop kids going into a room, that sort of thing. But you can defeat it with a screwdriver essentially. But anyway, let's take a look what you get. So it comes in this one box. So it does come as a kit, but they are separately sold components. So you can buy all these parts separately as well. First thing you get is a mag lock. This does feel really heavy. It's rated up to 180 kilograms of holding force, which isn't the highest, like if you buy a lot of them from like proper security places, they're a bit higher higher holding force. But this is still seems fairly decent. So you get the two components there, you get this part that's the electromagnet itself, that would go in the door frame. This part here is just the essentially metal bar that goes in the door that will stick onto that. And then you get various pieces of mounting hardware, so you get some screws to mount the mag lock, you then get a big bolt that goes through the door. I won't be installing this on the door in this video, but that will be in the future video when I actually use this stuff, because this is one of the components I will be using. But yeah, that's maglock you get. You also get things like a card in Chinese, presumably some sort of warranty card, don't know. And also a drilling guide, which is actually quite nice. So you can stick that up and work out where you should drill to mount it. So that's maglock. Next thing you get is the RFID tokens it talks about. So you get apparently 10 of these. This is one security flaw with these, is that these are very basic RFID tokens. So they're really easy to clone. You can buy these for very little money and you can buy a tool that clones these for like a few quid. So these are not very secure, they're very easy to clone. But yeah, you get those RFID tokens. Those can be useful in a future project if I'm doing something with RFID that's not security critical. Here you get a door exit button. So the idea is that you wall mount this on the inside of the door and you push it to exit. This is fairly standard, it's not actually doesn't actually seem too bad quality. I don't need it for my project, but it doesn't seem too bad. It's just a simple momentary button that's it's only got one set of terminals. So I don't know if it's push to break or push to make, but it's not It's not got both, which is a bit annoying. So you can't, you can't have it set for normally open or normally closed. You've only got one, but it'll work for the system. Feels fairly cheap, but it actually seems okay. Next box, we'll see what we've got here. Cool, so here we've got the keypad. So this is the bit where the security risk is, and we'll demonstrate it all, the, all shortly. There's the keypad in there. Actually looks okay. On the front you've got a keypad with buttons, which are actually tactile, pressy buttons. It does feel quite cheap, but it was quite cheap. So you've got all these keypad buttons, and you've got the RFID reader that you'd read cards on. There's in the back, you've got a buzzer, a little terminal there, and then there's the terminal block that goes in, so you obviously plug that, you, you wire this into whatever you're wiring it into, plug that into there, and that connects it all up. So that's the keypad that would go on the outside of the door there. Comes with a little manual as well. And finally, we've got the second cut part that I'm actually going to be using out of this, which is a little power supply kit. So, here's a little power supply we'll take a look at in quite a bit of detail. And yeah, the idea is you put mains in here, don't quite like this, I don't like single insulated, well I mean in the UK you're not meant to have single insulated cables carrying mains unless they're inside trunking, so this isn't really compliant. What I think I'll do is I'll actually try and replace this with a bit of like proper flex inside and then run it out. It's also not earthed by the looks of it, it's might be a metal case, so again I think I'll maybe need to do a bit of modification to add an earth to it. 
but you're meant to put the mains in there. And on the side here, you've got this power terminal block, which I think actually removes, does it? Yeah, this actually unplugs so you can put the wires in and then push it in. That's quite nice. And into here, you've basically got various contacts. So you've got a ground connection and a 12 volt connection, that's just constant voltage. Then there's what, I can't remember what negative comm is. Then you've got normally closed, normally open. And then, and then push, which is a signal from the push button. So the idea is you wire stuff up to the 12 volts in the push button. That sends a signal into this, which has a relay inside it, which also can then switch the mag lock using normally closed, normally open. It's also got a time adjustment. So you can see there, you can adjust the time that the door is meant to be unlocked for. So when you push the push button or scan your card, how long will the door remain unlocked before it locks again? So again, we'll take a look at that in a fair bit of detail. But that's all stuff you get with the kit. You get a power supply, keypad, cable for the keypad, RFID tokens, door exit button, and the mag lock. So what I'll do now is we'll go and take a quick look at this power supply in a bit more detail, and then I'll go away and set it all up, and then we'll demonstrate it working, and also demonstrate the problem with it working. But yeah, back in a bit. Okay, so the first thing I want to take a look at is this little power supply. And it actually is quite a neat little device if you ignore the sort of issue with the mains cable we'll take a look at later. But what I've done is I've just got a very simple demonstration set up here. This isn't the full thing, that'll come later. Oh, and also in the box I found it came with a wiring diagram. And what it shows here is on the power supply, you've got these terminals here. So it shows connect calm and normally closed off to the lock. And then it shows to connect 12 volts up to the access controller to power it. And then to connect the signal out of the access controller and the exit button into push and ground. Well then, what we'll do actually, we'll go, and lay, go in and take a look at it, but what I've done here to wire it up is I've connected just a mains cable on just now, I've just used a couple of wagos just to bring it onto a bit of mains flex. So we can plug that in and power it up. I'll sort this out better later. As you can see, it's now turned on, so it's got a power, power LED on it. Then into the side here, I've wired just the door exit button, and then this wire here we'll take a look at later. So with the door exit button connected, we can now take a look at the voltage on these contacts. So the multimeter here, hopefully you can see that on camera. There we go. So it says to connect the door the door contact, the magnet, between normally closed and common. So common is negative, it's common negative, there. And then if we connect to normally closed, you'll see we have 12 volts on it. And the idea is that in this, in this current state, the mag lock will be powered and the door will be locked. If you look at the normally open contact, that's unlocked. It's got like a couple of volts on it, but I'm, I don't know what's causing that. But essentially the relay is not, so is closed, is open on this side and closed on this side, providing 12 volts through. Normally closed, normally open. And then what happens is if we check the voltage on normally closed and push the door exit button, which is linked between ground and push. And I've checked the voltage, it's about 5 volts it's using to switch there. So put that on to common, that onto normally closed, you see we've got voltage. If we push the exit button, the voltage drops down to like a couple of volts. And if we let go of the button, it'll sit for a couple of seconds and then jump back up to 12 volts again. And that's the time delay it talks about. So on the little on the side here, there's this little potentiometer you can set, and that that lets you set the time delay. So if you set it all the way to the lowest, it's instant. You push the button, it switches the voltage off. You let go, it instantly comes back. But you can also set a time delay, which you probably want if you're actually like pushing a button and then walking to the door to exit. Otherwise, you'd have to hold the button down while you open the door. So you see that? Try it again. So hold those buttons down. Push this button. The voltage disappears, let go again, a couple seconds, voltage comes back. I also found that if you hold this button down, it will stay unlocked for as long as the button's being held, and it'll only start the countdown when you let go. Although interesting actually, if you hold it down for longer than the countdown, then let go, it locks instantly rather than the countdown. Okay, so when you push it quickly, the timer starts, and then the voltage comes back. But if you hold it down, it's obviously started the timer. So because I've held it down longer than the timer period, when I let go now, the voltage instantly comes back. I'm just sort of demonstrating that because if you're going to do what I'm going to be doing and using this in a slightly unconventional control mechanism and controlling this separately, it's quite good to know this sort of behaviour. You've then obviously got the normally open contact, which is the opposite. So you put that there, put that there, and then no voltage, press that, 12 volts. Now, these are for different types of locks. So with these you get fail safe and fail secure locks. A fail safe lock, which is what I'm using with a mag lock, 
means if there's a power failure, this whole system switches off, the door will unlock. And therefore you connect that generally to non normally closed, so it needs a voltage to be locked. The alternative would be a failed secure lock, which you would generally want to supply a voltage to to unlock, in which case you put that to normally open. Those would be on doors where you want them to lock if there's a power cut. But with that you have to be very careful because you, if you need to get out in a fire and there's a power cut, which can quite often happen in a fire, you need to be able to get out. So an example would be that on like a door where it's held shut with a mag lock, you probably want that to unlock in the event of a fire. However, if I look for example at the entry to my building, which is a building of flats, there's an intercom system that has an electronic lock on the front door. However, to get into the building I use a key and to get out I use a thumb turn. So on that you'd want a fail secure lock. So in a power cut, I can still get into the building, I can still get out of the building, I just can't buzz people in using my intercom system, but the building's kept secure. So that's why you'd use normally closed, normally open. It really just depends on the type of lock you're using or whatever you're controlling with this. So the next part we're gonna take a look at is these control pins here, which aren't detailed on this wiring diagram. And on a lot of listings, they're very vague about it. They'll, I've seen things say like, connect to video intercom and all this sort of stuff. It doesn't really make much sense. I've seen another listing describing this as like auxiliary power supply, which isn't the case because that's the 12 volt pin there. That's what your power supply is. But I found one listing that does explain what this is. And it says input five to 24 volts for, for open. And that's what this is. You supply a voltage to this, negative on the top, positive on the bottom, and that will open the door. So if we take a look at how this works, we see that if we look at these pins here, the voltage, there's no voltage on them. It's not, an, it's not an output. So we need to supply a voltage to this. So just because it's the easiest thing I had to hand, I've got this little 12 volt battery bank thing. And I just wired a barrel jack onto that. So that's just a little 12 volt input. We'll plug that into here. And that's got a little switch to supply the power to turn power on and off. That's currently off, so we plug that in there. So currently there's no voltage on those contacts. And if you look down here, we can see there's 12 volts on the output. If I were to turn this battery bank on, supplying 12 volts to those pins, the voltage disappears, the door unlocks. And if we turn, turn battery supply, the power supply off again, it comes back and locks the door. So that's what this is, and this is really useful. So if you've got an external system that supplies as a voltage output, like a logic level or a, just a general GPIO type pin signal, you can connect that into this control header here and use that to control the relay in this. So you're not having to do something like have a relay that switches. So if you want to control this from say a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or a microcontroller or some other control system, you don't have to worry about trying to put a relay between push and ground to simulate a button. You can actually just have a standard voltage output between five and 24 volts feeding into here and use that to trigger the relay in this. So that's a really nice way to be able to switch the mag lock or your whatever lock you've got on and off through one integrated device. And that's why I bought this. I want to be able to use an external system with a logic output to control the mag lock. So that's really interesting. That's quite a cool thing. And I've not seen anyone explain how this works before. So I thought I'd actually make a good point demonstrating what that is because there's very little information on it. So now let's take a look at this power supply and take it apart and see what it's like inside. Because there's a couple of changes I'm gonna to want to make before I actually use this. The first thing I just noticed while unplugging this is it doesn't actually have a discharge resistor on the input cap, like input cap, because I pulled the plug out, touched the pins, and got a bit of a slight fright from that, gave me a little shock. So that's not great. But it isn't too bad inside, so I'm just going to take the way it goes out to remove the wires. Just going to feed that out. There we go. And we've got the power supply here. So it's quite a nice metal enclosure. It feels good, quite apart from the stupid mains wires. It actually seems quite a good quality little device. Nice metal on the outside, powder coated. Feels really good, and you've got these little tabs to wall mount it or mount it to whatever fixing you're using. There's a screw on each side, so we just take these screws out, and that'll open it up. And what we're going to be trying to do here is replace these individual single insulated wires for the mains input with a proper piece of mains flex that will be proper double insulated and also earth this. So that comes out, and we can just pull these cables through, which Pull through that grommet there. There we go. That just comes off. And there we've got the inside of it. So it looks like quite a nicely built little device. It doesn't look bad quality at all. It's just that mains input cable is just really rubbish. Obviously I'm not Big Clive. I think he did a video about one of these. 
I'll, if so, I'll put a wee card up to link to it. But it seems like quite a nice quality little device. There's your relay there. But what I want to look at is a way to replace these two wires with a bit of flex and connect an earth. So what we'll do is we'll take this board out and take a look at underneath and see if we can work out how we're going to sort this flex. So the first thing is these two regulators are sort of bolted to the case. Let's take these screws out here. So now one thing I will quickly want to take a look at before I take the board out is you can see there's this little solder pad here, just right here. That's designed for the earth thing. So if I check the continuity between that and the case, we'll see if we get continuity. So put multimeter there. Put one probe on that solder pad, the other probe on just the case inside the screw thread, and see if we've got continuity to there. Because that is basically connected to a trace that goes straight through this screw. So they've clearly designed the board to be earth. They've just not actually connected a wire to it, which is really annoying. So what we'll do is we'll continue to take the board out and then we'll take a look at how to solder wires onto that properly. Cool. And now if we take it out, I'll just unplug this terminal block from the outside of it first. There we go. And the board will just come out. So that's the board out. See it there? This little metal plate just comes loose. That's what's holding the regulators in, just basically heat sinking. And there's a tiny little piece of plastic under here, so that's clearly what's stopping, like, the underside of this board coming into contact with the case. But that's not, in my mind, enough insulation. This isn't, I wouldn't class this as double insulated at all. This really should be earthed. But if we take a look at the board there, it's fairly nice construction looking. Um, I don't know what that this was there for, for adjustment. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, there's your potentiometer for adjusting the timer. There's the relay, various other components. Now what you can see down here is a little opto-isolator, and this is clearly what it's using for that control input. So your control signal, which is just a voltage, goes to that opto-isolator, and that's what it's using to sense that voltage and switch the rest of the circuitry. And there's this potentiometer here. I don't know what that's for. Um, I don't really fancy going trying to fully reverse engineer that, but I'm wondering if that's like maybe a sensitivity thing for this opto-isolator. Not sure. But there's a little potential over there that might adjust that. I don't know. But I don't seem to need to adjust it. That control input works perfectly fine. So now there's the pad I want to solder an earth wire onto. And if you look underneath here, there's the two pads that these cables, these wires are soldered onto. So hopefully I can get a bit of mains flex, desolder these, solder live and neutral onto there, solder earth onto there, and we'll be good to go. The only other tricky thing we'll need to figure out is how to get it through the case. Because the case has this little rubber grommet in it that's, while it's fine for these two wires, it's far too thin, I think, for a bit of mains flex. I don't think I would get a bit of mains flex through that. And you really need to have something to protect a bit of mains flex going through a piece of metal, some sort of grommet to stop it scraping. So I'll need to figure out a solution to this. What I think I might do... So now is if by some sort of magic, I've actually been able to force this cable through the existing grommet, and it's like the most perfect size like it's there's proper resistance there but you can move it through you can push the cable in so that's really good i'll need to find a way to put a bit more sort of strain relief to stop that pulling out the hole I might just put a zip tie through it or something just to stop you being able to pull it out because you could technically pull it and put strain on the solder joints which is also an issue with the old wires but that's actually gone really well so all i now need to do is try and strip this all off get it off all soldered to the board properly and then we should have a much safer earth earth enclosure with a proper bit of double insulated flex that also looks a lot more professional and a lot better. So I don't know why I didn't do that from the start. But yeah, that actually worked out really well. Okay, so I've now finished. So as you can see here, I've soldered the live neutral onto the bottom here, onto the existing pads where the red wires used to go, and then I've soldered the earth onto this pad here. And I've done the sort of same methodology of using a UK plug, where I've left the earth wire slightly longer than the other two. So if this was to pull out and these were to like rip off, the earth one would be the last one to disconnect. And in order to stop it pulling out, I've put a cable tie around here extremely tightly. And the idea being that if this was pulled, when this hit the hole, it would not be able to go through. So the cable can move through the grommet. It's very, very tight, but it can move through the grommet. As soon as this hit that hole, it wouldn't move anymore. And that's on there extremely tightly. So yeah, that's all connected on there. Now, Previously it was just two red wires, there was nothing, and there's nothing on the board defining live and neutral. 
However, there is a fuse on the board, a little glass fuse, which is also worth bearing in mind in case that ever blows. And that's on this terminal here. So I deliberately put the live to that, so the live is the one that goes directly into the fuse. So it also means it's properly, like, you know, live and neutral are properly colour coded now. So yep, live's gone onto the one with the fuse, neutral's gone onto the other one, and earth's gone on here. So all I need to do is put the board back in the case, and then just fit it all back together. So there we go, so now mounted back in the case, all those wires there. So hopefully we can just pull the rest of the excess through the case, and put the case back on. It's definitely very tight in that grommet, which is actually really good, you want that grommet to be tight, because that's stopping tension on the cable that's inside the case. Pull it nice and tight there. Of course it'll stop at that uh, cable tie I've put on. There we go. So as you can see there, we can now open that up. The cable ties stops it. And of course, because these are just single wires, they're a bit more flexible, so they can bend around inside the, the case a little bit. So in theory, we can probably just slide that all together. There we go. Yep, and I can obviously open it up and pop it open just to access it. And probably, I can open that enough to get the board out and remove it from the case. So I don't need to worry about trying to force the cable back through the grommet. I can open it up, unscrew it from the case, and then take the board out. There we go, so that goes in there. Shut that there, and put the case screws in. And then hopefully we'll be able to first of all check that the case is now earthed, which it should be, and then we can power it up again. Definitely check the case is earthed before I power it up again, just in case of any incidents, but yeah, put that case screw in there. Put it on the other side. And it's one of those things, like realistically, would it have cost them much more to just put a bit of proper mains flex on it? Like they don't have to supply like a plug. They just have to put a bit of mains flex on there. But anyway, that's there. Put the plug here, which the lid's still not on it, I'll put the lid on. Like that. And now let's check the earth continuity. So that's there. Got a multimeter. Put that on to resistance. Get that. And then what we'll do is we'll measure the resistance between the earth pin on the plug and the case. And as you can see there we've got full continuity. So yeah, it's made yep, there we go. Obviously it's relying on me physically pushing things into each other so it's not a sol totally stable reading. But as you can see there, we've got continuity to the case. So we actually do have earth continuity which is really really good. So now, because we've got earth continuity, and now we regard this as being a fairly a much safer device, let's plug it in and see if it works. So, again, we terminal block into the front there. Plug it into the mains, which is not switched on, so not on there. There we go. And hopefully, plug this in, it should light up. There we go. That's worked. So, that's now got the mains flex on it. Now, as with the other components, we've also got the little access controller. So, you see here it is, it does feel quite cheap, you can tell it's a cheap device. It's just got sort of fairly tactile buttons on the front here, but it does sound kind of hollow. Then you've got a little RFID reader here and a little LED up the top. Around the back of this plastic mounting plate we can take off, and then we can take a look at inside it. It's not really much to see here. Screw away. So now, if we look inside here, you're going to see we've got this connector block here. This connects up to this here that's included, so you plug that in there and you connect the appropriate wires up to what you're connecting them to, so you probably need to like put terminal blocks on here or Wago connectors to connect that through. That goes in there, you've got a little sounder there for the beep sounds it makes. There's the RFID antenna up top that's under here. And there's a few, there's a bunch of different connections here, I'm not sure what they all are. All the manual says connect as lock minus to ground and use that into the control on the power supply. But I think you could potentially connect lock negative and positive up and connect potentially actual locks into this. It's designed to be used with different control systems, so you might not necessarily use that power supply. You might hook a lock directly into this. You might connect the exit button directly into this. There's other features like bell, minus and positive. And the idea is you connect them to a doorbell, so the button here would ring a doorbell. Which of course is a bit inconvenient, because if you've not got a doorbell hooked up to this, you've got a button with a bell on it that people might try and press and then wonder why you're not answering the door. It's not so bad on this one, but I've seen other ones that have really obvious push for doorbell buttons, and it's like, well, if you're not using that, it's not very obvious. But, again, don't use this. Other than that, there's not really much to see. A couple of little chips there's a main microcontroller that runs it. There's a little jumper here between normally closed and normally open. So that's probably for the type of lock. Some locks want 
power to unlock and some want locks want power to lock and that'll just be to switch between the two except normally open here which is what this lock would not require but it's normally closed lock but I don't know um, yeah it worked so yeah that's the little board there so that's it there it feels fairly cheap but it does work there are metal ones but again even the nice metal ones don't provide really any more security than this this is not secure so we'll take a look at it in a second next up we've got the mag lock itself here it is Seems fairly nice quality. It's not as big as some of the really powerful ones, but it seems fine. So what you've got here is you've got this plate which goes in the door. The idea is that this sort of smooth side goes to the magnet and this more bumpy side goes against the door. And I think the idea is just that this grips against the wood and stops it rotating. When you mount this, it comes with various bits of mounting hardware. I'll do a proper video where I actually do mount this on a door in the future when I'm doing a proper project with this. But what you would do is you drill a hole through the door, you'd feed this through from one side You'd have that go through. You have that sit behind the magnet behind the door, and then you put this big screw, or this big yeah, this big th screw through here on the inside, and well on this side here, and that would go through the door, and the door would be clamped in between. So that's how it how it mounts the door very securely. As for mounting this, it's not too bad. Essentially, on the bottom here, there's these two holes here. You put an Allen key that's included through those, unscrew it, which removes this top plate. This little plate on top comes off. What you then do is you can put screws through from underneath through these holes, screw this plate to the door frame, and then you again put the magnet back up and put the Allen keys back in. So it's not too bad. As for the connection, there's just a pair of bare wires coming out of this that, are, that when you take this apart are just potted into this magnet. So you can't replace those, so you really need to connect those to a terminal block or something and then connect those into whatever you're connecting it to. And I suppose if you're careful, you could potentially drill through the door frame and feed these through neatly or notch a bit of the door frame out and bring it around the back. So it's not ideal, I'd rather have some terminal in there I could fit my own wire on and route it into different points on it, but it does work, and for a cheap device it is suitable. So yeah, that's the magnet includes. Okay, so I've now wired all this up as per the instructions that are supplied, and let's take a look at the setup. So we've got this bit of wood here, we can basically imagine this being a wall with, like, a wall that's separate, each side separated by a door. So this would be the outside where you have just got the card reader, and then if you take a look at the other side, flip it over, you can see what we've got is we've got the power supply and we've got the door exit button. And this would be on the inside of the door. And then this also goes off the mains and then this hooks up to the mag lock, which would then be on the door. So in its current state, we can see it's obviously going to be locked, that's the default. So we try and pull this magnet off, it's not going to come off. That is very securely on there. However, if I were to press the door exit button, that would unlock the magnet and the magnet comes off. Put that back down there and release the button, you'll hear it click back on. There you go, and that's now locked again. Obviously you can set a time delay on this and then the button would keep it unlocked for a little while. So that's the inside of the door. So if we flip it back over again, take a look at the outside, we can see the card reader. So that's it there. Now by default there's no pins programmed into this or anything, but there's a default like admin code you can use, which you'd obviously want to change on this, but don't use this anyway, so don't bother about that. But I've enrolled a couple of codes, so you can first of all just enter a pin, so one, two, three, four, hash, goes green, and the door is now unlocked, like that. Put it back on, and you'll hear it click shut, and that's now locked again. Interestingly, this has its own timing that's in addition to the timing on the power supply. You can also present RFID tokens, there's one there, scan it on, beeps, goes green, and unlocks. And then it'll lock back on again. If you take one of these ones that isn't enrolled, try and open that. It beeps indicating an error, because this tag isn't set up. But the problem with this is how easy it is to defeat. In fact, the design of this system means that I can defeat this with nothing more than a screwdriver and a paper clip. And actually, if I wasn't worried about damaging this, I think I could probably defeat this without any tools at all other than like a hammer or like a rock. So let's see how we do this. So, the system's running and as you can see it is totally locked. Like that, There's, that's not coming off. What we need to do is we undo the card reader, so we remove the screw on the bottom, which is just a, of course, a standard Phillips screw. Take that out. Take that off. And then we can just lift the card reader away. Like that. You notice it's still powered on. And if you look on the back here, there's a connector block that's going in. So all we need to do is pull this out. So now pull the wires out there, and if you look on the back here, there's a handy guide as to which wire does which. You can see it's 
12 volt ground bell, which is just a bell push. And then there's this lock minus and ground. Now, if we look at this wiring diagram here, we can see it says to connect lock minus and ground to the push connection on the power supply. So all we actually need to do now is short lock minus to ground and the door will open. So for that, we've got a paper clip. So let's open this out like that. And then simply work out which pin is which and wedge the paper clip in and the door will open, which is the problem with this thing. So imagine the connector goes in there. Lock minus is this yellow one and ground is obviously the black one. So we short yellow to black. So, so this paper clip's a bit too big to fit in the holes in the front. We can just jam it in the back. So again, yellow on there, shove the paper clip in, and black here, shove it into there, here a click, and it's unlocked. And obviously, so obviously that took a little while because I was showing it, but that would have taken seconds if I was doing it without actually explaining what I was doing. That's now totally unlocked, put that back, take the paper clip out again, and it's locked again. That's how easy that was. And again, just shove this back in between yellow and black, here a click, and it opens. And now that was me using a paper clip and a screwdriver, but I'm pretty sure you could do this destructively and do this without any tools at all, because this is just a plastic frame. So if you smash this hard enough, this will just break off. That won't be a problem. That'll get you to this connector block. Now, obviously I've used a paper clip to break, to bridge these terminals, but I'm pretty sure if you put enough force on this and just pulled at the wires hard enough, you would just break the wires out of this connector you would literally just need to break the black wire and the yellow wire out of the connector and just touch the ends together. And I imagine if you rip them out, there'd be enough exposed copper on each. You push them together and you've unlocked without any tools at all. So yeah, that's a pretty big issue. But the other thing with this is, as you can see, because I've done this properly, I've not destroyed it. The scary thing with this is, I just need to take the paper clip out, plug this back into the power supply, like that, or not the power supply, into the card reader, which beeps because it's now powered up. Push this back down onto the frame. Put the screw back into the bottom of it. And now simply, the door works normally. So the scary thing with this is someone with a system like this could break into a building by taking the card reader apart and shorting it out, reassemble it all, and there'll be absolutely no sign that anyone's broken in because this looks totally normal. So yeah, while on paper this looks good, it's not a very secure system. So there you go. That was a look at this very cheap access control system from Amazon and why you really shouldn't use something like this. It's maybe okay, say for example, in a home environment if you want to stop kids going into like a office or in an office where, where everyone's basically trusted but you don't want employees going into the cleaner's cupboard or something like that. But realistically, if there's ever a chance that anyone's going to want to get into the room behind this, and they're not, going to have a, they're not going to have an access code or card, they're going to be able to get into this. It doesn't require sophisticated attack at all. So yeah, this is not a secure system. And my fear with something like this is people buying this and not thinking about that. I've seen videos and reviews of people who have put these on office buildings and even external doors that are accessible to the public and using this in place of a normal lock and just not really thinking about the fact that they've effectively now ruined the security of their door and you could open it with a screwdriver. So it is kind of concerning seeing these products on the market. Now obviously I didn't buy this to use it. I bought it for a different project that will be coming up in the future where I needed the mag lock and the power supply module and it cost about the same to get it with the access controller. So I thought I would do it to sort of demonstrate the problem with this. But yeah, it's scary because there's a lot of reviews on Amazon that are showing this, people going, oh, it's great, look at this. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. It was so easy to set up. I'm securing my house with it. I'm securing my garage and not thinking of the problem with this sort of thing. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Um, also stand by for the video where I actually put, do my project using the power supply and the mag lock, but using a better system than the access controller. And yeah, if you're interested in buying this for some bizarre reason, there are links in the video description. So yeah, thanks for watching.